To the Man on Trail by Jack London. Dump it in. But I say, kid, isn't that going a little too strong? Whiskey and alcohol's bad enough. But when it comes to brandy and pepper sauce and dump it in. Who's making this punch anyway? And Malamute Kid smiled benignantly through the clouds of steam. By the time you've been in this country as long as I have, my son, and lived on with rabbit tracks and salmon belly, you'll learn that Christmas comes only once per annum. And a Christmas without punch is sinking a hole to bedrock with nary a pay streak. We'll stack up on that for ye high sired, approved Big Jim Belden, who'd come down from his claim on Maisie May to spend Christmas and who, as everyone knew, had been living two months past on straight moose meat. Ain't forgot the hooch we ain't made in the tanana, have ya? Well, I guess yes. Boys, it would have done your hearts good to see that whole tribe fightin' drunk, and all because of the glorious ferment of sugar and sourdough. Well, that was before your time. Malimu Kidd said as he turned to Stanley Prince, a young mining expert who had been in two years. No white woman in the country, then, and Mason wanted to get married. Bruce's father was chief of the Tananas and objected like the rest of the tribe. Stiff? Why, I used my last pound of sugar. Finest work in that line I ever did in my life. You should have seen the chase down the river and across the portage. But the squaw? asked Louis Savoy, the tall French-Canadian, becoming interested. For he'd heard of this wild deed, when at forty mile the preceding winter. Then Malamute Kid, who was a born raconteur, told the unvarnished tale of the Northland Loch Navar. More than one rough adventurer of the North felt his heartstrings draw closer and experienced vague yearnings for the sunnier pastures of the Southland, where life promised something more than a barren struggle with cold and death. Well, we struck the Yukon just beyond the first ice run, he concluded, and the tribe only a quarter of an hour behind. But that saved us, for the second run broke the jam above and shut them out. Well, when they finally got into the Nucknucklilero, the whole post was ready for them. And as to the four gathering, ask Father Rabau here. He performed the ceremony. The Jesuit took the pipe from his lips, but could only express his gratification with patriarchal smiles, while Protestant and Catholic vigorously applauded. By gar, ejaculated Louis Savoy, who seemed overcome by the romance of it. La petite squaw. Mon mis en brave, by gar. Then, as the first tin cups of punch went round, Bettles the Unquenchable sprang to his feet and struck up his favorite drinking song. There's Henry Ward Beecher and Sunday school teachers all drink of the sassafras root. But you bet all the same if it had its right name, it's the juice of the forbidden fruit. Oh, the juice of the forbidden fruit. Roared out the bacchanalian chorus, Oh, the juice of the forbidden fruit. But you bet all the same if it had its right name. It's the juice of the forbidden fruit. Well, Malamute Kid's frightful concoction did its work. The men of the camps and trails unbent in its genial glow, and jest and song and tales of past adventure went round the board. Aliens from a dozen lands, they toasted each and all. It was the Englishman Prince who pledged Uncle Sam, the precocious infant of the New World, and the Yankee Bettles who drank to the Queen, God bless her. And together, Savoy and Myers, the German trader, clanged their cups to Alsace and Lorraine. The Malamute kid arose, cup in hand, and glanced at the greased paper window where the frost stood full three inches thick. A health to the man on trail this night. May his grub hold out, may his dogs keep their legs, and may his matches never miss fire. Crack, crack. They heard the familiar music of the dog whip, the whining howl of the Malamutes, and the crunch of a sled as it drew up to the cabin. Conversation languished while they waited the issue. Huh, an old-timer. Cares for his dogs and then himself, whispered Malamute Kid to Prince, as they listened to the snapping jaws and the wolfish snarls and yelps of pain which proclaimed to their practiced ears that the stranger was beating back their dogs while he fed his own. Then came the expected knock, sharp and confident, and the stranger entered. Dazzled by the light, he hesitated a moment at the door, giving all a chance for scrutiny. He was a striking personage, and a most picturesque one, in his arctic dress of wool and fur. Standing six foot two or three, with proportionate breadth of shoulders and depth of chest, his smooth-shaven face nipped by the cold to a gleaming pink, 
his long lashes and eyebrows white with ice, and the ear and neck flaps of his great wolfskin cap loosely raised. He seemed of a verity the Frost King, just stepped in out of the night. Clasped outside in his Mackinaw jacket and beaded belt held two large Colt revolvers and a hunting knife, while he carried, in addition to the inevitable dog whip, a smokeless rifle of the largest boar and latest pattern. As he came forward, for all his step was firm and elastic, they could see that fatigue bore heavily upon him. An awkward silence had fallen, but his hearty, What cheer, my lads? put them quickly at ease, and the next instant Malamute Kid had gripped hands. Though they had never met, each had heard of the other, and the recognition was mutual. A sweeping introduction and a mug of punch were forced upon him before he could explain his errand. "'How long since that basket sled with three men and eight dogs passed?' he asked. "'Well, and even two days ahead. "'Are you after them?' "'Yes, my team. "'Run them off under my very nose, the cusses. "'I've gained two days on them already. "'Pick them up on the next run.' "'Oh, you reckon they'll show spunk?' asked Belden, in order to keep up the conversation, for Malamute Kid had already the coffee pot on and was busily frying bacon and moose meat. The stranger significantly tapped his revolvers. Well, when'd you leave Dawson? Twelve o'clock? Last night? As a matter of course. Today. A murmur of surprise passed round the circle. And well it might, for it was just midnight, and seventy-five miles of rough river trail was not to be sneered at for a twelve hours run. Well, the talk soon became impersonal, however, harking back to the trails of childhood. As the young stranger ate of the rude fare, Malamute Kid attentively studied his face. Nor was he long in deciding it was fair, honest, and open, and that he liked it. Still youthful, the lines had been firmly traced by toil and hardship. Though genial in conversation and mild when at rest, the blue eyes gave promise of the hard steel glitter which comes when called into action, especially against odds. The heavy jaw and square-cut chin demonstrated rugged pertinacity and indomitability. Nor, through the attributes of the lion were there, there was wanting a certain softness, the hint of womanliness, which bespoke the emotional nature. "'So that's how me and the old woman got spliced,' said Belden, concluding to the exciting tale of his courtship. "'Here we be, Dad,' says she, and me may be damned,' says he to her, and then to me, "'Jim, you get out in them duds of yours and—' I want a ripe part slice of that 40-acre plowed for dinner. And then he turns on her and says, And yeah, Sal, you sail into them dishes. And he sort of sniffed and kissed her. Now I was that happy. But then he seen me and roars out, Yeah, Jim, and you bet I dusted for the barn. Any kids waiting for you back in the States? asked the stranger. Nope. Sal died for any come. That's why I'm here. Belden abstractly began to light his pipe, which had failed to go out, and then brightened up with, well, how about yourself, stranger? Married man? For reply, he opened his watch, slipped it from the thong which served for a chain, and passed it over. Belden pricked up the slush lamp, surveyed the inside of the case critically, and, swearing admiringly to himself, handed it over to Louis Savoy. With numerous by gars, he finally surrendered it to Prince, and they noticed that his hands trembled, and his eyes took on a peculiar softness. And so it passed from horny hand to horny hand, the pasted photograph of a woman, the clinging kind that such men fancy with a babe at the breast. Those who had not yet seen the wonder were keen with curiosity, and those who had became silent and retrospective. They could face the pinch of famine, the grip of scurvy, or the quick death by field or flood, but the pictured semblance of a stranger woman and child made women and children of them all. Never have seen the youngster yet, he's a boy, she says, and two years old, said the stranger as he received the treasure back. A lingering moment he gazed upon it, and then snapped the case and turned away, but not quick enough to hide the restrained rush of tears. Malamute Kid led him to a bunk and bade him to turn in. "'Call me at four sharp. Don't fail me,' were his last words, and a moment later he was breathing in the heaviness of an exhausted sleep. Well, "'By Jove, he's a plucky chap,' committed Prince. Three hours sleep after seventy-five miles with the dogs and then on the trail again. Who is he, kid?' Jack Westendale. Been going on three years with nothing but the name of working like a horse, and any amount of bad luck to his credit. Well, I never knew him, but Sitka Charlie told me about him. It seems hard that a man with a sweet young wife like his should be putting in his years in this godforsaken hole, where every year counts two on the outside. Well, the trouble with him is clean grit and stubbornness. 
He's cleaned up twice with a stake, but lost it both times. Here the conversation was broken off by an uproar from Bettles, for the effect had begun to wear away, and soon the bleak years of monotonous grub and deadening toil were being forgotten in a rough merriment. Malamute Kid alone seemed unable to lose himself and cast in many an anxious look at his watch. Once he put on his mittens and beaver skin cap, and leaving the cabin, fell to rummaging about in the cache. Nor could he wait an hour designated, for he was fifteen minutes ahead of time in rousing his guest. The young giant had stiffened badly, and brisk rubbing was necessary to bring him to his feet. He tottered painfully out of the cabin to find his dogs harnessed and everything ready for the start. The company wished him good luck, in a short chase, while Father Rubel, hurriedly blessing him, led the stampede for the cabin. And small wonder, for it's not good to face seventy-four degrees below zero with naked ears and hands. Malamute Kid saw him to the main trail, and there, gripping his hand heartily, gave him advice. "'You'll find hundred pounds of salmon eggs on the sled,' he said. "'Dogs will go as far on that as with one hundred and fifty of fish, "'and you can't get dog food at Pelly as you probably expected.' "'The stranger started, and his eyes flashed, but he did not interrupt. "'You can't get an ounce of food for dog or man till you reach five fingers, "'and that's a stiff two hundred miles. "'Watch out for open water on the thirty-mile river, "'and be sure you take the big cutoff above La Barge. "'Well, how did you know it? "'Surely the news can't be ahead of me already.' I don't know it. And what's more, I don't want to know it. But you never owned that team you're chasing. Sick of Charlie sold it to them last spring, but he sized you up to me as square once and believe him. I've seen your face. I like it. And I've seen... Why, damn you, hit the high places for salt water and that wife of yours and... Well, here the kid unmittened and jerked out his sack. No, no, I don't need it. And the tears froze on his cheeks as he convulsively gripped Malamute Kid's hand. Then don't spare the dogs. Cut them out of the traces as fast as they drop. Buy them and think they're cheap at ten dollars a pound. You can get them at five fingers. A little salmon and the hutuklinqua. Oh, and watch out for wet feet, was his parting advice. Keep it traveling up to twenty-five, but if it gets below that, build a fire and change your socks. Fifteen minutes had barely elapsed when the jingle of bells announced new arrivals. The door opened and a mounted policeman of the Northwest Territory entered followed by two half-breed dog drivers. Like Westendale, they were heavily armed and showed signs of fatigue. The half-breed's been borne to the trail and bored easily, but the young policeman was badly exhausted. Still, the dogged obstinacy of his race held him to the pace he'd set and would hold him till he dropped in his tracks. When did Westendale pull out, he asked. He stopped here, didn't he? Well, this was super erogatory, for the tracks told their own tale too well. Malmute Kid had caught Belden's eye, and he, scenting the wind, replied evasively, All right, perp back. Come, my man, speak up, the policeman admonished. You seem to want to get him right smart. Has he been getting cantankerous down Dawson Way? Well, he held up Harley McFarland McFarland's for 40000 exchanged it at the PC store for a check on Seattle, and who is to stop the cashing of it if we don't overtake him? When did he pull out? Every eye suppressed its excitement, for Malamute Kid had given the cue, and the young officer encountered wooden faces on every hand. Striding over to Prince, he put the question to him. Though it hurt him, gazing into the frank, earnest face of his fellow countrymen, he replied inconsequentially on the state of the trail. Then he espied Father Roubault, who could not lie. Well, a quarter of an hour ago, the priest answered, but he had four hours rest for himself and the dogs. Fifteen minutes start and he's fresh? My God, the poor fellow staggered back, half fainting from exhaustion and disappointment, murmuring something about the run from Dawson in ten hours and the dogs being played out. Malmue Kid forced a mug of punch upon him, then he turned for the door, ordering the dog drivers to follow. But the warmth and promise of rest were too tempting and they objected strenuously. The kid was conversant with the French patoy and followed it anxiously. Well, they swore that the dogs were gone up that Siwash and Babette would have to be shot before the first mile was covered, that the rest were almost as bad and that it would be better for all hands to rest up. Lend me five dogs, he asked, turning to Malamute Kid, but the kid shook his head. I'll sign a check on Captain Constantine for five thousand. Here's my papers. I'm authorized to draw my own discretion. Again, the silent refusal. Then I'll requisition them in the name of the Queen. Smiling incredulously, the kid glanced at his well-starked arsenal, and the Englishman, realizing his impotency, turned for the door. 
But the dog drivers, still objecting, he whirled upon them fiercely, calling them women and curs. The swart face of the older half-breed flushed angrily as he drew himself up and promised in good round terms that he would travel his leader off his legs and would then be delighted to plant him in the snow. The young officer, and it required his whole will, walked steadily to the door, exhibiting a freshness he did not possess. But they all knew and appreciated his proud effort, nor could he veil the twinges of agony that shot across his face. Covered with frost, the dogs were curled up in the snow. It was almost impossible to get them to their feet. The poor brutes whined under the stinging lash, for the dog drivers were angry and cruel. Nor till Babette, the leader, was cut from the traces, could they break out the sled and get under way. A dirty scoundrel and a liar. By gar, him no good. A thief. Worse than an Indian. Well, it was evident that they were angry, at first at the way they had been deceived, and second at the outraged ethics of the Northland, where honesty above all was a man's prime jewel. And we gave the cuss a hand after knowing what he did. All eyes were turned accusingly upon Malamute Kid, who rose from the corner where he had been making Babette comfortable, and silently emptied the bowl for a final round of punch. It's a cold night, boys. A bitter cold night, was the irrelevant commencement of his defense. You've all traveled trail and know what that stands for? Don't jump a dog when he's down. You've only heard one side. A whiter man than Jack Westendale never ate from the same pot nor stretched blanket with you or me. Last fall he gave his whole cleanup forty thousand of Joe Castrol to buy him on Dominion. Well, today he'd be a millionaire. But while he stayed behind at Circle City taking care of his partner with the scurvy, what does Castrol do? Goes into McFarland's, jumps the limit, and drops the whole sack. Found him dead in the snow the next day. And poor Jack laying his plans to go out this winter to his wife and the boy he's never seen. You'll notice he took exactly what his partner lost. Forty thousand. Well, he's gone out. What are you going to do about it? The kid glanced round the circle of his judges, noticed the soften softening of their faces, and then raised his mug aloft. So a health to the man on trail this night. May his grub hold out. May his dogs keep their legs. May his matches never miss fire. God prosper him. Good luck go with him, and confusion to the mounted police, cried Bettles to the crash of the empty cups. <laughs>